A lot of people wonder how to make the transition from the corporate life or working full time into managing other people's money or raising money or doing deals themselves. And so that's something that I did. I was able to leave my corporate job after a few years of doing deals and I've raised about 30 million. But my friend, Ryan McKenna, has gone from uh, basically being a corporate manager to having over two billion in assets, having raised over three hundred million dollars. So he's what I aspire to be someday, as far as the investing side. But uh, really excited to have you today, Ryan. How are you? Hey, Bronson, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on your show here. Oh, absolutely, man. Thanks for making time. And you get a lot of a lot of investors keep happy there. A lot of uh, mouths to feed there in the sense of your time. <laughs> yeah, so. I got I got to go in a few. I got a few calls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we were talking. We were actually kind of joking before the. Uh, before we got on here, just out, you know, those days where you have you know, like 10 or 20 calls in a row back to back lined up and how do you stay fresh and stay present for everybody. But, um, you know, definitely challenging. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your journey and kind of how you, uh, I see the baseball bats in the background there. So I know that's part of your story. So why don't you, uh, why don't you fill our audience in just a little bit of your story and how you got here and, uh, you know, how you decided on real estate. Yeah, no, happy to share my story. And, uh, I, I guess the start, I, I, came from an entrepreneurial family. Uh, my dad uh, uh, still runs a business today. And so I kind of grew up in a you know, family that, uh, you know, really um, loved having control of their time. And my dad was able to coach me in every sport. My mom was always there, uh, you know, to help out with whatever was needed. And I just felt like that was a great lifestyle that I grew up in. And I wanted to replicate that someday myself. And so um, I, I actually was able to get a scholarship to play baseball at Arizona State, which was my dream uh, school. And, uh, you know, part of that was just, you know, the work ethic, the discipline, but, you know, having supportive, you know, family that that helped me get there. And so when I got to Arizona State, you know, the next goal was to try to make it to the, the next level, which would be, you know, professional in Major League Baseball. And, uh, you know, my career got cut short um, with an illness I, I got at the end of my sophomore year it was you know pretty tragic because I'd worked so hard to get to that you know top level in division one baseball and to literally have it ripped away mm. just as things were you know getting to a crucial point in your career where junior years when a lot of the you know a lot of my teammates went pro um at Arizona State and I was the only one from my freshman class who didn't and so I was out doing a medical red shirt because I got diagnosed with ITP ITP which is a blood platelet disorder very mm -hmm. similar to leukemia and lupus and so that made me you know become bedridden for I mean I, I was in and out of hospitals for 6 months trying to figure out what's mm -hmm. going on and it was at the worst you know time of my baseball career and it was at that moment that I you know had to really sit back and think about plan B what was it going to be and and I was always in my mind going to be that successful athlete that you made, you know, good money and was able to invest it and be smart about it. That was always the plan, but, you know, right. baseball didn't work out and I didn't, you know, get to pursue that dream. But uh, while I was, you know, in the hospital, I started reading about real estate and investing. And, and at the time someone gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, by Robert <laughs> Kiyosaki. And that was like my blueprint for like, all right, you know, Plan B is going to you know, get into the business world, going to you know, get into real estate. But ultimately, I wanted to be successful in the business world and then take that money, whatever I made, and invest in, in real estate syndications. And so um, that's you know, at a very early age, uh, I would say you know, the most people I talked to, I knew about these types of deals, these real estate syndications. And in fact, a teammate of mine, his father was an apartment syndicator in Phoenix. And so I got firsthand experience while I was kind of sidelined with my baseball career. I was rehabbing for a year as I did a medical red shirt. But I was like a fly on the wall with this guy, you know, he's buying apartments in Phoenix. And I was just like, you know, how do you do it? And he, he you know, told me what a syndication was all about and how he was raising capital from investors. And I just thought it was really cool to go in and buy, you know, these two, 300 unit apartment complexes. And I told myself someday I'm going to, I'm going to do that and, and syndicate these deals. And so, you know, as I fast forward, it took me, you know, a little while to get to a point in my life where I had some extra capital, but I'd always been studying and learning. And I knew as soon as I had the money, I was going to be an investor. And so um, in 2016 was really when I started my journey into apartment syndication investing as a passive investor. Uh, prior to that, I did a lot in, you know, single family rentals, but that just wouldn't allow me to scale up to the to level that, you know, I, I see um, what's available with, with the apartment syndication. So uh, it was a good way to get my feet wet and to learn. But ultimately, the apartment syndication is really what I think, you know, allowed me to walk away from my corporate job uh, within a three year period of investing. And uh, from there, I started to help others um, invest in, you know, the similar deals that I was investing in and, you know, just kind of sharing my story with how it worked for me and what my plan was. 
And um, it, it just really related to a lot of people who were kind of feeling the same way about maybe their job or their life. And uh, that, that created McKenna Capital. And then from there, you know, we have not looked back and we've been able to help a lot of investors and it's, it's been a fun journey. And uh, I'm kind of living the life that I, I guess I'd always dreamed about and uh, kind of that life that I wanted after a baseball career. And, uh, you know, but I'm glad I got into the business world a little bit earlier and found, you know, real estate syndication because it's something I'm truly passionate about and, and I love investing in. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, I love your story and I can relate with that as well. I think for me, it was three years from the time I did my first deal in multifamily to where I left my corporate job, which is about a year ago. And you've just, you know, taken off and done well. And of course you used all those experiences in your life and your network. And we we're just talking before about how, you know, you, you've just, you've just grown so much and it just comes from treating people well and doing the right deals and really making sure that you're you know, really, uh, you know, and I look at you, I have a lot of respect for you because you, you do, you really take the time to work with investors, really take the time to listen to their goals and, and all, and all the things that you're doing. So well done on, on growing your business and as well as helping other people grow financial freedom, whether they're active or passive, obviously, you know, passive is a way people can replace their income also. Um, yeah. Let's talk for a minute because you you've done a lot of different things. I mean, like I saw you were involved in the Bitcoin mining fund, lots of multifamily. I mean, of course, the bread and butter of investing at fast investing, I think, is multifamily. But yeah. just can you just give us a list of some of the different assets that you've been involved with over the years, or maybe you're involved with now? Yeah, there's a lot of different assets that we've either syndicated or I've personally invested in. Um, but yeah, Bitcoin mining is, is one of them. Um, Self storage, car washes. ATMs, uh, senior living, um, you know, we've done some debt funds. Uh, that, that's probably, you know, the top five, I, I would say. Um, I've done some angel investing myself, but I, uh, you know, that's a much riskier investment, but that's something that I said, small percentage of my overall portfolio. But yeah, value add multifamily is our core, but the other alternatives, uh, I see those as just ways to further diversify your portfolio. And they have a lot of the similar characteristics to multifamily, where there's you know, the cash flow element that we all love as real estate investors. Um, but there's also that appreciation or equity upside, and then the great tax benefits that come along with um, with investing in real estate. So those uh, are, are really, I think, more niche alternatives that people invest in. But I see a growing interest in that space, especially if uh, an investor has you know already a good foundation of multifamily assets in their portfolio and they want to just, you know, further diversify. Those are some other um, investment plays that one might consider. Yeah, that's great. No, I was going to ask you too. Um, I know obviously people want, you know, some deal flow, they can obviously join your investor list. And I encourage everybody to, you know, start a relationship with you because you do have some great deals that come out, but uh, just as an individual and as an investor, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, expand in new asset classes? Like, let's say I'm a, a full-time passive investor. I want to be how do I learn about things that, you know, maybe I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, or how do I learn, particularly outside of, you know, I think multifamily is kind of out there, everybody sees it, or if you hang on the multifamily crowd, you'll see that. But how do you learn about senior living? How do you learn about these other types of things? Is it just through your network or is it going to events or what are ways people can kind of learn more about different types of assets? Yeah, I tend to study uh, what others are doing and just stay connected. So I would say, you know, myself personally, like, if there's something I'm researching or looking into, I, I try to, you know, seek out who, who's the best in that space or who's someone that's relatable to me that's doing something that I, you know, might want to do or replicate or do, you know, take the best kind of practices that that they're doing so well at. And so I then I will tap into my network, too, and see, you know, maybe there's some of our investors who have invested with. Uh, you know, another syndicator in a different asset class, or maybe they're just familiar with it. They've invested in that space before. So I'm constantly talking to investors all day long. So I, I get a pretty good pulse on, you know, what their interests are and can run by, you know, certain asset classes that I might be considering and just get feedback instantaneously from them. And so it's this great kind of circle because I feel like I'm in the middle of it. I'm just connected with a lot of different people, not only investors, but other operators. And then just always kind of just, looking at what the latest um, investments are. I mean, there's definitely some emerging asset classes out there that I think are very attractive, but there's also the tried and true, you know, just 
value add multifamily I keep going back to is just like the, the bread and butter of, of these investments. But, you know, you can see different um, alternatives out there. And I think going to conferences is great. Um, you can do a lot of research online, but, you know, listening to different podcasts or, or reading certain blogs, I mean, that's just a great way to start and get a good foundation. And then I would say, you know, go find out who, who the key players are in that space and get on their list, you know, start reading their newsletters and, and just learn that way. And then, you know, ultimately, I think if you do enough research, you know, one of my things is that, you know, I like to be active and, you know, it's, it's hard to time the market. So I think, you know, a lot of this is just going out and, and at some point pulling the trigger and taking some action and investing. And that's how I learned. So I've tried different um, alternative investments and, you know, things go well and they, they, you know, that they end up, you know, working out. And I feel like it might be a good investment for our investors. You know, I would consider, you know, maybe looking at what a syndication might look like in that asset class. But I usually go in first uh, myself and just, you know, do a test run and get to know the people involved and just see kind of what it's like. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of inv different investments out there. It's all about, you know, mitigating risk. And so um, that's something that's really big in, in my um, in my book as far as, you know, trying to figure out like what's worst case scenario and how do we, you know, avoid that? And does this deal have, you know, elements of it that would protect, you know, myself or investors? And so, um, but I'm also, you know, I have a certain threshold, a uh, small percent of the portfolio that I know I could lose all my money in, but I could also, you know, generate a 50 or 100X multiple on it. And so that's the trade-off. Um, but if you built a really good solid foundation of cash flowing um, deals, you know, you can have some of this play money that gets to be fun down the road where you can then take on additional risk for maybe more upside. But I, I would never start there. But I, I think if you can build a good um, solid base, you get to take on a little bit more, you know, calculated risks that might have some bigger upside that I think there is, you know, a, an appetite for, um, you know, for that from, from certain investors I see where um, maybe the cash flow is less important, but they want a bigger payout and they're willing to take on a little bit more risk for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, a lot of people, when they first start, it's just, you know, real, uh, Warren Buffett says his famous, you know, rule number one is don't lose mm -hmm. money. And rule number two of investing is don't forget about rule number one. But at some point, you know, having you know, five or 10% of your wealth, once you have, you know, more than enough, that it, it, it has the potential to have a five, 10, a hundred times upside. I mean, it's huge because then it can give you, um, I actually know a guy that invested in an oil and gas deal recently, and he, you know, put almost a million dollars in it. And it was basically a 30 to 40 X payout that he'll get over about a 10 year period. So it's huge, you know, I mean, he's already wealthy anyway, but now he's thinking about, okay, yeah. how am I going to, you know, put this into other things. Pretty nice. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what's happening now in the market, right? Our favorite topic, um, you know, and just a lot of interesting things. I think investors are concerned because they see interest rates rising. I think at the time of this recording, the Fed is talking about right raising rates again significantly. Um, what do you see happening? Are you seeing investor sentiment kind of uh, get more concerned about investing in things. And, and we're seeing that a little bit on our side, but what, what, what are, what are some things you're seeing and what do you think uh, investors should consider right now as far as what's happening? Yeah, I, I do see a little slowdown kind of investor appetite just right now as they're being more cautious and kind of a, you know, a wait and see mentality. Um, but I've also seen for the right deal, if it comes along, they'll, they'll come out of the woodwork and invest in it. So yeah. I, I think the, Right now, the tr the traditional like you know solid deal you know is going to generate some some good interest, but the opportunistic one that is a great deal in this environment, those are the ones I'd see be very attractive from an investor standpoint, where it's not your everyday you know hey we went through some sort of process and won the deal. It's hey we got this off market opportunity, mom and pop investor, and there's some story to it that um, you know, that maybe the, the, the value or the, the cost basis that we're going with, um, in this environment is just super attractive. And we're able to say, get the deal with, um, lower leverage and the returns are really nice. You know, those are the types of scenarios I think that, um, investors will, will gravitate towards, but the traditional kind of, um, everyday kind of vanilla value add deal. Those in this environment, I, I've seen investors kind of say, ah, hey, that's nice, but I'll probably wait for a better one to come along. Um, that's just kind of my read. Um, yeah. and, but I've seen some of the other alternatives be a nice play. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, 
the value add multifamily just still keeps producing consistent results. So it is one of those that, you know, it's always hard to time the market. I, I tell investors, it's like, you know, no one's ever going to perfectly nail it. And I look at this as like, if you're in the market, your money's compounding over time, it's growing. And whether that's 8% or 10% or 12%, you know, as long as you're not losing money, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're getting yeah. ahead. Right. And, and so, um, I think, uh, yeah, with interest rates, you know, we're waiting to see, is there going to be some sort of stabilization in the market, you know, coming up? Um, we went through a period where uh, it was definitely a seller's market. We had exited a lot of properties and did very well. And then we saw it shift to, you know, more of a buyer's market when interest mm -hmm. rates started rising and we weren't getting as many offers on some of the assets that we had up for sale. And then people were starting to negotiate and say, well, my cost of capital has gone up with uh, higher interest mm -hmm. rates. I need a better deal. And we were like, well, we don't necessarily, you know, need to sell. We, we've got great cash flow. We'll just hold on to this until, you know, there's a better um, economic period where we, you know, would want to sell those assets. Uh, but then we would play the same card when we're buying. We would say, hey, our cost of capital has gone up. We need yeah. to get a better deal. But <laughs> we weren't in this environment, you know, saying we need to go out and find deals. It was, you know, hey, if we come across great opportunities, we'll pursue them. And, um, you know, because we didn't need to buy right now. We could just sit tight and just really, you know, kind of hunker down on operations. Um, but what we've seen right now is that, you know, we've built great relationships in the marketplace with a lot of different brokers. And now they're coming to us saying, hey, so-and-so is, is willing to you know, make a deal or, you know, they've made good money on this. They're willing to sell for, you know, a, a slight discount. You know, are you interested? You know, those are the types of deals I see that become very attractive because now we can underwrite it and make an offer that is very attractive, you know, for this environment and kind of cherry pick the best deals out there. But those don't come along every day. Um, but I, I, I would say those types of deals are the ones we're seeing to be the most attractive in this environment. And, um, you know, they just come up from time to time. And, um, you know, so I, I do think at some point we'll get kind of back to maybe where we were for the last few years. But it's just going to take some time to, you know, let the new expectations kind of set in with, you know, what the deals are going to look like, what the returns are going to look like and where buyers and sellers kind of can come together and, uh, you know, start to see more transactions happen, um, you know, w when that comes to be. Yeah, for sure. No, it, it is interesting that, you know, the confused mind of an investor will just say, wait. Yeah, and I think with inflation being what it is, whether it's eight or 10%, I, I think it's more like 15 to 18% if you look at a lot of the actual costs of things. And if you wait two years, you could lose 30 to 35 to 40% of your purchasing power, your wealth. So just having, like you said, having it working somewhere is very advantageous. There's an inflation hedge there. I personally think that in the long run, uh, higher interest costs and other ownership costs are actually going to translate into higher rents is what we're seeing. Just continue the rents rise, rents rise, rents rise, all kind of all over the country. I really yeah. see them slow down, particularly in markets that are growth markets like where you and I are buying. So, um, well, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, your journey as in a real estate investor, uh, when you look back over the last, you know, 10 years or, or so, what's up, what not, uh, what, what are some things you wish you had known about real estate when you started? Or what are some things you wish you had known about uh, doing these big syndicated deals or things you wish you had done sooner or you hadn't done or just any reflections on the last you know, number of years that you since you started? Yeah, I guess I would say I, I wish I got into it earlier. <laughs> and that, that's very common. Um, Comment I hear from a lot Everybody of Everybody says that. <laughs> Everyone says that. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm talking more on the syndication uh, uh, side mm -hmm. of things because, you know, I, I, even though I knew that these, you know, deals existed and the syndication model, you know, was one that I thought was very lucrative, you know, I didn't jump in as early as maybe I, I could have because, you know, I think we're all, you know, we want to do as much research and diligence and wait for the right, you know, opportunity, find the right team. Um, but right. a lot of this, if I would have got started a few years earlier, I, I just, you know, would have been multiples ahead of where I am right now, but I'm happy with where things are now. Uh, yeah. But I just know that, you know, that was something that maybe could be a hindrance to most people out there. And had I just jumped in and and just almost kind of, I don't want to say learning on the job, but like, you know, going in with a few partners early on, I think, you know, yes, you, we would have gotten through, you know, maybe the first deal. And then the, you know, the second one would have got a little easier. I think I could have started a few years earlier. Um, but, you know, I think the timing was, Hey, I'll, I'll take it where, where it was when we started because the market has done really well over the last, you know, four or five years. Um, but also I, I think um, just, you know, I was in a position where I was, you know, I was doing well at my, my, my corporate job, but I was, you know, super stressed and just juggling a lot. And, you know, it would have been nice to maybe put myself in a better place uh, mentally with, 
less stress and, and just, um, you know, just flip the switch a few years earlier. So, um, you know, I, I'm always, you know, someone that's very, um, you know, driven and uh, always want to kind of do the best that I can, but I feel like, um, you know, there's a cost to that. And so um, it would have been nice to get into real estate earlier because there's still stress here, but it's just, it's different compared to like what I had in, in the corporate world. It was like, I had to, you know, and not only my own stress, which I put, you know, the most amount on myself, but, you know, you had people above you that were, you know, had a certain version of what, you know, success looked like to them. And you always had to live up to their expectations. Whereas, you know, when you're a full-time real estate investor and syndicator, it's like you control your own destiny. You can slow yeah. things down if you want to. No one's telling me like, oh, you have to do a certain amount of deals or you have to invest a certain amount of money. And that's very liberating to have all that control. And, right. you know, I don't stress about that. And, um, you know, like I said, we were talking earlier, like I wouldn't mind if it slowed down a little bit right now anyways. And like, <laughs> that would never happen in the corporate world. You know, they'd be know, like, go know. find another job, you know, like, and yeah. it was just like, you know, a, a world of like, what have you done for me lately? And, and, and that's fine for, you know, it, it was great for the period of, in my life that I was there, but yeah, I, I walked away from a scenario where I was doing very well. And that was tough because once you kind of burn the bridge, there's it, no going back. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I could have probably done that a few years earlier and been further ahead. Um, but you know, I, I try not to live with regrets. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you have to, you know, balance out, you know, you don't want to look, spend too much time in the past because it can obviously, you know, limit your, your future or where you're at currently. But I think it's, I think your uh, story is really inspiring. It's uh, something that obviously, you know, you've done, uh, you know, through raised $300 million, you, uh, you know, you, you've, you've, you know, over 2 billion in assets. That's, that's really commendable. It's way more than what we've done and, you know, aspire to be there someday. But um, I was going to ask you too, if somebody listening or just even for myself, uh, what what are qualities you think make someone successful in doing what you do? Where you're basically, you know, you're you're co GPing deals, you're working with investors. Um, I can think of a few things, but what are what are like maybe a couple, two, three qualities you think have made you so successful? You know, I, I think it just it, I'm able to be myself, very natural. I think um, there's an element of trust that I, I believe investors feel, you know, right from the get go, and um, I just. I try to be very genuine because this is something when I share what I'm doing, like this is what I personally am doing and I absolutely love it. It's not like I'm selling something because at the end of the day, like that's not the approach. It's like, Hey, I've got a great opportunity. Like, do you want to be part of it? You know? And, and yeah. I always take the approach of like, I hope if you came across a great opportunity, you'd think highly enough of myself that you would give me yeah. a call and say, Hey, Ryan, you got to check this out. And that's all it is. And I feel like, um, you know, we just built this kind of, I don't want to say a following, but like a lot of like-minded people who are like, yeah, this is cool. We're doing this together. And the syndication to me is like this, it's, it's a teamwork, you know, uh, approach, which I love being, a, you know, former athlete. Um, and, and so I, I think it's the relationship building. I think we've gotten really good at like, not only like with just working with investors and just being, you know, a good partner, but like, I, I, I think what's made us successful too, is we've gotten in early with some great relationships that, you know, maybe the whole vision wasn't there, the whole track record, but, you know, you could see like where this team was going and together when we would partner, we just made it that much better. And I feel like, you know, that, that comes back to a lot of my venture um, angel investing is at some point, you know, you, early on, you're investing on the entrepreneur, like they might not even have a working product and you have to really read that person. And, you know, are they going to be successful? And, you know, maybe the product isn't, but like, you just know, if you bet on that person long-term, they're going to do well and you'll do well. And so that's kind of the approach and the philosophy I took early on when we partnered with a few operators. And, and I just, I really, believe that, you know, these are going to be people that are going to run through, you know, a, a door for you and they're going to, they're yeah. hungry. They're, you know, they want to um, have a great experience because they're still building out and that's who I associated with. And that's who I felt like, all right, we all have these different skill sets we could bring together to make us, you know, even better, but that's the experience investors got. And so I kind of gravitated towards those types of people. So I think, you know, I guess an ability to maybe see um, potential in people and just, you know, are they motivated? Are they going to be able to get through tough times? What is their character like? Can I trust them? How do they communicate? And so I think pairing that with like the experience with our investors is like, 
I'm just an average, you know, person who happens to love what I'm doing and surround myself with good people. And if I can communicate well with others and just really kind of put, you know, a bunch of smart people in a, in a room together and just let things naturally happen, um, you know, I, I believe good things are going to come out that uh, out that yeah. end. So um, I always tell investors, like, look, I mean, you could look at all these different deals. Eventually, the numbers start to look the same from one to the next. And the part that's most important, in my opinion, it, it's the people behind the numbers. And if you can get that part right, if you can find a team that you're really comfortable with, that you believe in, and, and you ride with them you know, long term, I think you're going to end up you know, in a very good place and be very happy. Um, so, so I guess you know, just the relationships uh, and trust factor um, is, is super important. And I think that's something that to me, I just feel like it's, it's, it's come natural. Uh, I tell people like, I feel like I was born to do this. I didn't even know yeah. it existed, but it just, <laughs> it's something I, I truly love and I'm, I'm so yeah. passionate about it. Um, and so I think investors kind of feel that when we're talking and, and, and it just resonates with them as far as the story and kind of what I'm trying to, to achieve and build. And so I think that's probably, you know, and that's what investors have told me as well too. So I'm kind of sharing, you know, what, what I think, but also some feedback I've gotten over the years as well. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think it, you know, obviously it's a good fit for you. A lot of people don't like sitting on, you know, 10 phone calls a day with investors. Like you're saying, you know, it's, and same with me. I, I love, that's like my favorite part of what we do is being able to talk with investors. And, and I think people generally have a, a good sense of, of how to, to, how to evaluate somebody. And if there's somebody who seems like kind of what, what you see is what you get and they're well-spoken and is what we're doing. And I think, you know, you build trust through, even delivering bad news sometimes when things don't go according to plan and something and, and being able to do that. And then I know out over time that it's amazing. The referrals, they just start to scale on it one upon another as you start to have performance, things perform well, and you have, you know, home runs and things like that, which are really great. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. I know some people are going to really take a lot out of that because uh, a lot of people wonder, I've actually really thought about um, creating something for sales professionals that want to raise money for real estate, right? Cause I think there's a lot of transferable skills that people have to be able to, you know, manage accounts or work with, you know, businesses, and then to be able to kind of bring that to this space and obviously create value for people in a high trust way. So I do like that, you know, it's not like a, you know, we're not out there hunting for business or, you know, go to like, try to, you know, the hunter mentality is like, oh, get, get the sale, whatever it takes. And nobody wants to be sold, right? It's this, this idea of a farmer where you're out creating value and creating content and creating, uh, you know, value in the, in the marketplace. And then people are really drawn to that. So, uh, well, I, I see you creating a lot of value for a lot of people. Um, one or two, I just really wanted to thank you for, for coming on today, Ryan. I just have so much respect for you and for your business, for what you're doing, how you're really impacting uh, the investment world, as well as your investors. And just really, obviously your track record really shows it. So I encourage everybody to uh, connect with you, but how can people connect with you and reach out to you if they want to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, well, well, thank you, Bronson. That was very nice of you. And I know you're doing great too. And and it, it, it's awesome to be in this space. I tell everyone, like, you know, we're all in this together and we're all, you know, creating awareness and we're all growing and, and we're just making the piece of the pie bigger, you know. And so that's the part I truly love about it is like, yeah, there, there's competition, but it's nothing like what I experienced before. Um, it, it, it's very collaborative. And I think that gives the investor a good experience overall because, um, you know, it's the syndic the, the definition of the syndication is all of us working together and make it happen. Yeah. And I think that that, 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 that says a lot. So if investors want to uh, check out more that I would say, go to McKenna capital.com. It's, it's our, our website has, you know, um, links on there to all the different social sites that we're on. And if they want to sign up for our investor club, they can do that. And, uh, you know, I'll reach out and we'll set up an intro call. Um, but that's probably the best way, um, to get in contact with us. Awesome, man. Thanks. Well, I appreciate what you shared too. I think, uh, you know, people can look at it like it's a competitive thing or whatever, but I think, um, you know, the, the pie does get bigger as we work together, but it also, um, you know, it's just amazing, you know, 99% of probably 98% of people that could be doing syndications are not because they even never, never heard of it or they're just in wall street products. There's so much money in wall street. So really our big competition is really against wall street. So if we can unite together and help educate the community in the world, it really helps a lot of people. So, uh, Ryan, we appreciate you so much, uh, for being here and, uh, you know, to our listeners excited to have each of you here. Uh, and thank you again, Ryan, for the time. All right, Bronson. Thanks again. You have a good day. Thanks. All right. So Ryan McKenna has done some amazing stuff, lived quite a life just, and even his, uh, stuff he went through his health issue that kind of led him to really clarify his purpose, which really actually worked for me as well. Um, it wasn't a health issue. It was another personal crisis, uh, in my life. 
And that kind of led me to realize I wanted to, you know, leave my job and go do real estate full time. So it allowed me to be able to do that. But some real takeaways there, um, you know, just really continuing to find opportunities in any market. So don't, if you shut down the idea of doing deals, uh, keep your eyes open for good deals because there are some deals are actually getting way better. There's uh, discounts given kind of later as the deal gets closer to closing, if it's a multifamily deal or other types of assets even. So uh, again, it's not about what uh, a multifamily or real estate deal, uh, you know, it's not just falling in love, in love with that, it's falling in love with what it does for you, right? So if you're looking to reduce taxes, that's possible. If you're looking to grow cash flow and replace your living expenses, that's possible. I did that. Uh, and then a year ago, a little over a year ago, I was able to leave my job having covered my living expenses with uh, you know, real estate income, which is awesome. So um, anyway, I hope you got something out of this. If you haven't joined our investment club, enjoy you to, uh, enjoy, encourage you to go to bronsonequity.com slash join. We'll start a relationship with you. We'll be able to share some of these awesome deals with you. We're doing deals in multifamily. We're doing deals in the ATM space as well, which are just really unique. And But you're not hearing about them if you're not on our deal club or on our deal list. So check that out. Uh, please also uh, hit the like button if you're on YouTube or if you're listening to this, please do consider writing a review. Uh, when you write a review, it actually allows others to be able to find this content. So if you're getting value out of this, please, 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 uh, you know, like, uh, make a comment, subscribe and uh, write a review. That would so help especially on iTunes. If you could write a review on iTunes, that would help get this in front of other people. But uh, thanks for taking the time to educate yourself. It's truly how we get better, how we learn, how we grow, we help each other. And look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Mailbox Money. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.